Jade? Are you still responding to this memo? I guess I don't have much energy left to argue about passwords. I didn't even get a password last time. I had to leave abruptly because Solix and Aridin started dueling again. And then Feferi and Kanaya... It all happened so fast. And now Gamzee is hunting us all down in murder mode? He's been taunting me through other people's messaging devices. And leaving me disturbing notes. I'm sure others must be dead by now. And now Solix is blind? And I lost track of him somehow? I heard a stray honk and I ran and we got separated and... I'm starting to think that this must be a doomed timeline. That's why I can't get in touch with anyone. They must be dropping like behemoth leavings out there. And that must be why future Kanaya was talking in this memo. But now she's dead? Which makes that impossible. It wasn't supposed to happen this way. Gamzee isn't supposed to go crazy. I think if he does, it means we fucked something up. It means I fucked something up. He's my responsibility. I have to make sure he's safe. And I didn't do that. One time, one of the doomed Aradias told me she came from a time where he flipped out and killed everybody because of my failure. I didn't take her seriously, but I should have. She was constantly fixing my fuck-ups. Robots from the future always coming back to tell me how some hasty shit I did with frog breeding or whatever would make it impossible to win. My own personal mistakes probably accounted for more doomed Aradia bots than anything else. Which was sort of a silver lining, I guess. I don't think we would have beaten the king without her army. Not that it matters anymore. I've obviously become just another guy in a doomed timeline watching everyone around him die. I was just sitting here wondering what I could have done wrong this time. To make the timeline take a wrong turn? And pinpointing it seemed overwhelming, since I've made more terrible decisions than I can even count. But I think looking back, I know what it is now. It was before we got trapped on this meteor, before Jack showed up, before we beat the king. And I wanted to let you know, Jade, that no matter what I said, I think the final frog must be important. And Kanaya, if you're reading this somewhere in the past, maybe, I'm sorry, you were right. I was always in such a hurry to win, I didn't take the time to do what was necessary. Billia Slick needed the genes of that frog, and because I half-assed this so bad, everyone is going to die. See, I was thinking, about Jack and how he can't stand frogs. And I think I finally understand what's going on. I think I know what's about to happen at the end of our timelines. I think I know what the critical moment is, and it's completely my fault. Ectobiology is a touchy thing. Especially when you're building the genetic code for an entire universe. Our Genesis frog needed the genes from that final frog. But because I was in too much of a hurry to do the job right, he's missing a critical sequence in his DNA. So when we made him and watched him grow in the middle of Skya, and after all the fireworks and fanfare from the vast croak had subsided, I kind of felt like he didn't look so good. Like he was sick. I think I gave him cancer. I gave your whole universe cancer, Jade. Sorry. Its defective genes probably made it impossible for your session to be successful. Sort of like... Its reproductive system was damaged. What should be fertile ground for your new universe to grow? was replaced by a massive bomb rigged to blow up your whole session. Probably just one of many symptoms of a sick universe. It's not like you actually did anything wrong. You were fighting against the disease that was always inherent in your reality. The one I gave it. But I don't think it's like a normal disease. Not like a cellular mutation that's out of control. 
The cancer took a specific form, like a complicated series of terrible events rather than faulty cell division. It was an eventuality in your universe that was inevitable, that we all unwittingly helped make happen. All concentrated through the actions of one hostile agent in the system, with an instinct to destroy everything it hated, and then given the power to do so. And unlike a normal disease, it wouldn't gradually kill its host from within. The cancer left the body, chased out as if by an immune system. But the problem is, it wasn't any less deadly on the outside, and no less determined to finish the job. So I don't know what else it could be. What's waiting for us at the end of the countdown? Jack was expelled from your session somehow. Then he methodically destroyed all our planets, Prospect and Durst, and tried to wipe us all out. So that we couldn't do the same thing to him again. But he was always saving his true target for last. The one he hated most. Jack was the living embodiment of the disease all along. Noir is the cancer. It's him. Anyway, that's the end of how everything's my fault completely, and I'm garbage. Hope you enjoyed it, Jade! Not that you seem to recall this memo even exists. If you see Kanaya in Death Bubble Hell, please tell her I'm sorry I let her down. And if you see Solix wandering around too, let him know how ashamed I am I ditched him like a coward because I heard a horn go honk. And Terezi, if you see her, could you give her a message for me? Tell her that... Actually, never mind. I'll probably be able to tell them all in person soon! Seeing as an idiot in makeup is about to roll over my naked squeal pipette with a one-wheel device! Solux is okay. He's with me right now. Holy shit! You're alive?! Hold on. I really need to change these clothes. It's all your fault. Huh? It's all your motherfucking fault! Honk. Okay. You cracked off the top of the bottle to those fucking clown imposters that were all spraying out the flagrant motherfucking heresies at me. The flagrant motherfucking heresies, motherfucker, is what came from their mouths. It made me get my sadness on to see it. And my rage on fucking harder! I'm sorry. All my life, I believed that a fucking paradise to come would held the most ballers, darkest of carnivals to join. And a prophecy to tell all about a band of rowdy and capricious minstrels steeped in the good, harsh whimsy. The mirthful messiahs were foretold to be crashing that fucking pie stand and bringing the holy ruckus. Like a giddy fucking ninja, one wheeling headlong at the hugest fucking horn heap Shangri-La's got to see. I'm talking about the vast honk, you blasphemous motherfucker. What I believed in it to be was so beautiful. Us and them all mellowing in tents and bumping sounds, tossing back the fago and soaking the miracles up our face sponges, while the special stardust rained at our elixir sticky faces, like a bunch of fucking fairy powder from religion space. It was gonna be us and motherfucking them! Them and motherfucking us. This is like some trolling shtick, right? This ICP shit? But now, because of you, because of all of you and your fucking outrageousness, you stole up all my miracles away by revealing at me how the wicked shit was really kicked. Like some filthy fucking science stiff who at old times would be ruled unfunny 
without even getting his fucking trial on! And now I don't know what to think about the spiritual fantasies I had. Hulk! <laughs> Best troll ever. I don't even care if you're really into this stuff or not, it's awesome. Uh, what stuff? Like, horrorcore? Lame clown rap and stuff? Uh... Dude, are you an actual juggalo or not? Bro, that word you used ain't nothing real I've heard of. It strikes me as another heretical fucking bastardization of some sacred shit I take seriously in my bump biscuit. I mean, I guess, took seriously. <laughs> Do you really not know what I'm talking about? I have the idea that you put in my pan to sit there. That the Paradise Planet is a fucking joke! And the miracles are fake! Pure fiction. False, fakey, fraudy con jobs from a bunch of unfunny ninja harlequin bullshit artists! <laughs> I can't even tell if you're trying to troll me with this, or if you're actually having some weird emotional problem. Can it be motherfucking BOTH THINGS? Okay, I'm telling you, you need to watch this video. The song isn't even supposed to be released for another year or something, but I got it from an inside source. This is as hot as it gets. Hang on, let me dig it up. Deliriously biz nasty. Just took effing stringent chest plant into birdbath. Collarbone snapped, yo! Kinda hungry. At turn tech godhead, please enjoy, Mr. Strider. Was the same collarbone you broke before, dog? Make that hunger, you bitch! <laughs> Lol, at oofags, peace out, numb fucks! Ollie's outie! At God's gift to grinds. Dude, you gotta buy a new B bath? That's messed up. At dumb homo too. Not cool. At Mr. Liftoff. It was the other Seabone man. At Fat Nasty Trash 420. Nah, bruh. Birdbath was fine. No. Motherfuck no, bro. I'm not looking on any more of your blasphemies. I really just came back on you to motherfucking say. That while that sickening noise you did at me is your fault. There's something I did at you. What's mine? I did something that's motherfucking atrocious to your posse. Made your whole crew of jokers get to being kinda mentally motherfucking. In fucking fact, that atrocious business I got to doing, I did that shit to your whole universe as a matter of motherfucking fact. You see, you motherfucking see, I finally got all caught up in what's true behind the sweet murder mirth of the bitchin' blood circus. I reached deep down and got at where all the real harsh whimsies were hiding inside of me. In the angriest ways, I found up my dark ancestral chuckle voodoos within. And then, I focused them through the rage you made me have. And I went and made your universe terminal. None of that really meant anything, but okay. Also, you have me confused for somebody else. We never talked. I guarantee I would have remembered you. All that motherfucking matters is I remember you and what you did! I'm just all letting you in on the ways I set the high justice in motion. Made us motherfucking square, you and me! Me and you. That's cool, Juggalo guy, who I still can't quite tell is ironic about this or not. But, like I said, either way, it's all good. <laughs> you don't motherfucking believe! You need to get more spirituality into your superstition, ghost. Like the motherfucking faith jump that what I was. 
As if I'd forget to do my chuckle voodoos to you, too. To fuck up your dreams! Make your worst fears come alive. And get up on their haunts in your nap-happy pan. What? What fears? You motherfucking know, brother! It's the fucking puppet. The one that's all got to be my best fucking friend I got now! Now that my other buddy managed to be having his head chopped off. Oh god, did my bro put you up to this? I should have guessed he might have a hand in some of these shitty trolling escapades. Your bro's dead, bro! Couldn't keep my new friend captive no more. Release your nightmares right into my warm fucking embrace! And now I listen at what they whisper through my ear ducts. <laughs> Jesus, you are fucking insane! I'm all hearing these amazing motherfucking things. I think you'll help me refigure out what's the real reality about the miracles. He'll help me to motherfucking discover the truth of who the messiahs are. The real messiahs, not the false mess of lies. <laughs> So, my bro's idiotic ventriloquist dummy is responsible for the schizophrenic bullshit. Is that what you're saying? Motherfuck yes, bro. What else does he say? He says, all in this funny little voice, that is so very, 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 very quiet that it's time to go, mother fucking kill them all. Well, that sounds about right. Better do what he says, dude. Yeah! <laughs> Here was I to come at you with all these unruly upbraids I got pent up. When you know motherfucking what? I should be getting grateful to you for sharing at me your Way ridic heresies, brother. The road to the dark carnival has never before been paved with louder hawk horns to tread upon and scare the living motherfucker out of the no blood faithless with each step. <laughs> you are either literally an insane psychopathic murderer or some kind of trolling savant. Time to block you now, but let's do this again, okay? You fucking know it, bro. I like you. Wouldn't mind taking that pale marshmallow you got as a nut bone off your shoulders for this collection I got started on. Add a little strawberry jam to this peanut butter sandwich I'm making between my motherfucking lips. Holy shit. Hey, before you go, how about that we slam a little? Uh... They've both been proceeded to have one of the best wrap-offs in the history of Paradox Space. What did I say? I have repeatedly made it clear that the fifth wall is to remain off. I refuse to acknowledge this foolish man's self-indulgent rubbish. His frivolous charades have no place in this building or anywhere in this reality. Am I making myself understood, young lady? Swoon! Or will I have to suspend your furniture privileges again? I see. It's another one of your moods. We will have to work on ironing out this behavior before you meet your true master. He is a far less gracious host than I. Wait. What are you doing? No. Stop that. You render yourself in a more symbolic manner this instant. Thank you.
Oh, is this what we're doing now? Maybe I have not been strict enough with your breathing privileges either. Tisk, tisk, tisk. This vessel will reach your planet eventually. We can either go home the fast way or the slow way. Your express ticket can only be validated with the display of good manners, miss. <laughs> and there go the electricity privileges. I think now would be a good time for another round of re-education regarding her purpose. A little refresher on the prestigious employment opportunity for which she is being groomed. And since you are still my guest, it would please me to tell you this inspiring tale as well. It is a tale to remind her of the sacrifice she must make. One servant to remind all of her people of the sacrifice once made by long-forgotten heroes in a discarded reality. It is of this sacrifice the sufferer died to speak the truth, and it is his tale I will tell you now. Once, in this very universe you could say, Altania was home to a peaceful race. Trollkind had never known the corrupting influence in their evolution, which led them to perpetual war and violence. That is to say, they had never known me. As was true of the bellicose world we know, there came to be twelve heroes on this peaceful planet. These heroes, too, had twelve ancestors whose fortunes were intertwined with theirs. These 24 figures of legend were not of this world, but sent from the sky, delivered from a reality not yet conceived. On the eve of their race's extinction, the 12 heroes would begin playing a game. They would make an admirable effort, but they would fail. Their civilization had not prepared them for the rigors of this game, and the ultimate reward would fall shy of their grasp. But their failure was more comprehensive, more systemic, than a result of simple inadequacy so common to young players of this game. Though they could not recognize it for the bad omen it was, this session was not the one in which they had been spawned. Such is the symptom of a subtle glitch affecting certain sessions, an error designed to trigger an unfathomable cascade of misfortune throughout Paradox Space. This glitch is the calling card of the one I serve. It is the discreet, gentlemanly manner in which he reserves his place in a universe for later visitation. The heroes, understanding their defeat was absolute, sought advice from the mother of all monsters. She offered them a choice. The heroes could either accept their defeat along with the extinction of their race and put no others at risk, or she could show them a path to a second chance, to a reality in which the chosen heroes of their race would be strong enough to succeed with ease and claim the reward. This reset would come at the cost of wiping the failed heroes from existence. They would live new lives from scratch, playing different roles in the reset reality, with no memory of the game they played or the choice they made. The heroes chose to accept this bargain, and scratched their session. In doing so, they jump-started the reality in which the 24 figures of legend would together be created, and I as well, and then sent back in time to take our places in history. Though I was delivered well before history even began, before the dawning of life on their planet. This time around, I would oversee its development, and thus fulfill the mother's promise of an aggressive, ruthlessly prepared group of heroes. One that would not rest until victory was secured. The young 24 would again be scattered in two groups, 12 modern contemporaries and 12 ancients. But in addition to losing their memories of everything that happened before the scratch, there was another catch for the failed heroes. In the new reality, they would not serve as the heroes, they would mature to become the ancestors of the twelve they formerly regarded as theirs, and this twelve would be chosen for glory. These children would be the heroes to achieve victory, and have the reward easily within reach. 
Of course, this promise was fulfilled to the letter, as you have seen. The entire bargain was executed without a single hitch, as those authorized by my master always are. There was, however, one minor anomaly. One of the failed heroes, in his new life as an ancient on this now brutal planet, began to remember. This is his story. This is the story of the Signless. Few ever knew the sufferer's given name, presuming quite reasonably he had none, and he came to be called Signless. Unlike his peers distributed elsewhere in history, he was not given a sign at a young age. Alas, there were no signs reserved for one of his mutant blood. His genetic deviation from the social order made him a pariah, forcing him to wander the world alone for many sweeps, concealing the color of his blood to avoid certain execution. But it may also have been due to his mutation that he began to have the visions, spontaneous lucid imagery of his world in peace before its fall. He would never see the complete picture, or fully understand his previous incarnation's role in prompting this fall, or know of my hand in it. But the vision showed him all he needed to see. They held the promise of his people's true potential beneath the ages of conditioned cruelty. They held the spark of revolution. In time, the visions gave purpose to his travels. He would preach heretical ideas no one else dared to entertain, let alone risk discussing. He espoused the virtues of forgiveness, compassion, and equality among all bloodlines. He distributed his message intelligently, careful to preach only to those receptive, never attracting unwelcome attention. But his growing movement could go unnoticed by the authorities for only so long. The High Bloods were livid over the unprecedented heresy, and soon a massive sectarian war followed, spreading across the planet and throughout the galaxy. The conflict was lopsided, of course, with the High Bloods given full support from the Condess and her sea dwellers. Inevitably, the Signless would be captured, and when he was, it was not a matter of whether he would be put to the irons, but how hot they would be if he failed to recant. During his penance, it was said the sufferer's compassion for his people underwent a divine transformation into limitless, burning rage. It burned hotter than the iron shackling him to his imperial flogging jut, and redder than the blood soaking his righteous leggings. When he was finally killed, his anger rung through the cosmos with his last breath. This vast expletive was his final sermon, and somewhere encoded in its wavelengths was the truth in his teachings, waiting to reveal itself to any who would inherit his burden. Oh yeah! His teachings would also persist through surviving disciples, but in hushed tones. His following would dwindle to an obscure cult facing persecution for centuries. After his execution, the body was burned, leaving only his irons. They cooled in the ash, as if his anger itself was subsiding, and his followers appropriated their shapes in defiance of the high bloods. The symbols became the sign of the signless, always shown as colorless as the cold iron to conceal the stigma of his hue. This was as much a reminder to his followers to remain hidden as it was of the sufferer's sacrifice, and his rage hidden like heat in the iron, one day to be reignited by another of his bloodline. The sufferer preached that after he passed, another signless would come, heralding the end times for their planet. The second signless would continue his work and lead his people to glory beyond this realm. The followers kept his teachings alive for ages, even as the uproar surrounding the movement subsided. By modern times, the sufferer's scripture was little more than ancient superstition, all but forgotten, hardly the anathema of old. But the followers had already made their preparations in the shadows, and when the second signless finally came, he would have a Lucis to raise him and a sign to his name. The fuck? 
the sufferer acquired a less conventional upbringing to reach maturity. As a young grub, he landed in the brooding cabins where he would be expected to face his trials. But due to his mutation, surely no Lucis would select him. No creature sympathetic to his scent had been bred yet. His odds for survival would have been remote, if not for a chance encounter. The Dolorosa belonged to the rare class assigned strictly to serving the mother grub in the caverns, forbidden from visiting the surface. While on an errand, she found the young sufferer in his crater and immediately recognized the child as special, as well as in great danger. For an adult troll to raise a child was unthinkable, but she saw no other hope for him. The Dolorosa abandoned her duties in the caverns and fled to the surface to raise him. In time, she would become the first follower of his teachings and the first of his inner circle, but not his closest. Oh, hell no. He's talking about ancestors, isn't he? Surrounding him on his rise to infamy and throughout the rebellion were the most trusted elites among his devoted. The psionic was a mage of unequal telekinetic ability, who upon hearing the words of the sufferer was inspired to free himself from the sort of slavery typical of his mentally gifted class. But his most devoted of all was his disciple. She listened to every vision he retold, every lesson he preached, and faithfully recorded his scripture. Her ear was open to him always, and in time, his heart opened to her. To spread his message throughout the world, they took to the seas in the vessel of legend known as the First Ship. It was said their love went beyond the four quadrants, transcending the grid entirely. Whatever that nonsense actually means. He's keeping little girls locked up in weird rooms and rambling about troll ancestors. I just know it. The disciple was to be killed along with him. But at the last moment, the Executor inexplicably took pity on her and allowed her to escape. She absconded with the leggings, which remained the only physical evidence of his holy suffering. She hid in the caves for many sweeps, transcribing all his scriptures from memory on the walls and the blood of slain creatures, and lived the rest of her days in monastic savagery. Her dedication would be critical to the persistence of his message. But the Dolorosa was less fortunate and was sold into slavery. She spent the rest of her life as property of vicious sea dwellers. As for the Psionic, he was enlisted in a far worse, if more prestigious, service. Not in my fucking comic! He was forced to serve as helmsman for her condescension's imperial battleship. Psychics of his kind were exploited for interstellar travel, and his abilities made her ship the fastest in the fleet by far. She grew so enamored of her helmsman and his power, she would use her touch to extend his lifespan to match her own. Oh, damn. This place is bigger than I thought. Any idea which way he went? Come on, guys, help me out. Together, they explored the stars for thousands of years. Due to the speed of her ship, she would personally expand the boundaries of her empire, typically being the first to greet new races before conquering them. I bet he's behind this door. You hear me, Scratch? The jig is up! After making first contact, occasions which she generally kept cordial, she would move on to new territory, while a division of the fleet set a course for the unfortunate civilization and proceeded to tear it apart. It could be any of the lethal brigades under her command to receive the orders, be it the Thresecutioners, Cattle Reapers, Laugh Assassins, or Ruffy Annihilators. Each was notoriously cruel in its own way, and each carried out orders with absolute loyalty. Because while the Condess could extend a single life on her whim, she could just as casually cut short that of millions. Aha! Caught you red-handed, you bastard! You stop clogging up my story with your troll fanfiction this instant- <laughs> 
If angered, she could simply express her grievance through communion with her ancient loses of the deep and turn its psychic devastation on her multitudes. The class hierarchy played into her hands politically in this respect, killing off a haphazard swathe of the population or an entire class was suitable as a measure of last resort, but mass extermination does not lend itself well to practical governance. Its looming threat, however, is quite effective, especially while her empire is partitioned neatly into blood casts. She could use her leverage to delegate oppression to the subjugulators, whose unique abilities and exceptional brutality made them natural enforcers. They too were delegate in their governance, exploiting the pride and loyalty of dangerous blue bloods beneath them, and so on down the himo spectrum until the enslavement of the common castes was inescapable, in spite of their genetic gifts and strength in numbers. As a self-governing body, the land-dwelling portion of her empire was formidable, but her force of sea-dwellers was equally formidable, and the two were kept in check not only with the threat of psychic annihilation, but with their mutual hatred and distrust. The only threat to her power was unification through uprising, a possibility made remote once she fully decentralized the race from the homeworld. She scattered all but the children throughout the galaxy after the most recent rebellion led by the Summoner. Upon doing so, she became so comfortable with her grip on power, she risked venturing deeper into space than ever before to grow her empire. But the more space she put between herself and Glib Golub, the more she risked weakening her bond with the monster. The bond she and her successor shared with it exclusively could sway and become strengthened with the younger. Perhaps she grew complacent with the threat successors posed after such a long history of killing them with ease. Heresies upon reaching maturity were expected to challenge the Condes for the throne. It was not merely expected of them by their people, but demanded by their shared Lucis. I like to think of her as the pet I gave their race at the dawning of their species' evolution, like a sentience-warming gift. Again, it's just the sort of thing a good host does. That was not the right door. If the lapse in her custodial bond was significant enough, it was not just political power she risked. At such a distance, she sacrificed concentration needed to curb its most dreadful psychic shriek of all, the galaxy-wide extinction event called the Vast Glub. Of course, this eventuality proved a fitting reward for such reckless expansion of her territory. She chose the worst time possible to explore further from the homeworld than she'd ever been. She was scouring the edge of the galaxy for systems to plunder when she received word of her planet's devastation by meters. The young were being slaughtered. The Mother Grub was dead. The end times were upon her people. She ordered all fleets to return to Alternia. But such was her empire's expansion and interplanetary occupation, few could make it in time to provide any meaningful defense. She instructed her helmsman to pilot the ship faster than he ever had, and he did so through extreme physical duress. He was able to leap across thousands of light years in a matter of hours. The exertion likely would have killed him if the glove didn't get to him first. Her touch could extend life, but never restore it to her lament. In that instant, her empire was gone. Glyph Golem's swan song wiped out her entire race, save the Condess in her lone heiress leaving the Empire nothing more than a galactic necropolis of floating tombs. This looks like the right place. The hallway's all rounded shit, just like his big stupid head. She was forced to continue the journey home on auxiliary power. Her ship now travels near the speed of light, a pale shadow of its former velocity. It would take her another 612 solar sweeps after the glove to reach her destination. She should arrive any minute now. When she does, she will find nothing but ruins and dust. If she cared to look closer, she would find a city of slain exiles, a man on the moon, and a pair of black lovers locked in a deadly dance. But whether she looks or not, 
one thing will find her with certainty. A new employment opportunity. My beautiful panels, what has he done? That son of a bitch. It's gonna take so many sweeps to clean this mess up. So very, very many sweeps. Are you paying attention, protégé? This is where your role in the story begins. Now stop your pouting and listen, unless you want another helping to the backside of my... Oh, nuts. I seem to have forgotten my discipline broom. God damn it, he's got a bowl of these things. He's pulling his snooty horseshit candy bowl stunts to mock my little arrows now. Excellent host, my ass. Anyway, the last of the twelve ancestors arrived a bit late. In fact, she would cross through her portal six centuries after the descendants had come and gone. There weren't many left to look after her, so she ended up in foster care. I remember it like it was yesterday. And for one who has as much time on his hands as I, it essentially was. Flip. I would raise the girl to be groomed for her calling. My lessons would emphasize obedience, mastery of the clockwork magics, and being locked in a room. As you must have gathered by now, my employer will enter this universe quite soon. I will then relinquish my custody to him, and she will serve as his handmaid for an eternity to be specified. As you must have also gathered, she has already done so. Though her most common of blood should have let her expire in just a dozen or two sweeps, his curse kept her very much alive. And she did not intend to stay that way. Oh my god, how can these possibly be so delicious? His curse is one of conditional mortality, with the desired outcome contingent on her service. When I release her, she will take her place at his side and travel through time to carry out his orders. While I am his weapon of subtlety and precision, the handmaid is strictly an apparatus of terror and suffering. We have both paved the road to his arrival, I in my way, and she in hers. She would be present during every watershed moment in her civilization's development. Her recurrence in history would earn her the reputation of a demoness, more feared than even her master, a man though dreadful rarely makes himself seen. She stirred up class warfare and intensified bigotry in whatever era she haunted. She made sure the descendants would enter a world which prepared them well for the game and took measures to see that they would play as they did. But once they entered and their world was in ashes, her work was nearly complete. Now, six centuries later, she will be given one last order to follow before her curse was lifted. A simple recruitment job. Whoa, better go easy on these. Might need some later. The handmaid will enlist the Condess, extending the same bargain once offered to her. It will be the sort involving neither negotiation nor possibility of refusal, expressed in terms plainly understood by the psychotic genocidal. The Condess will serve as her new master's witch, carrying out his work in the places he cannot reach. There you are. Go ahead, keep talking, cue ball. I've got you in the crosshairs of my broom bristles. I have got you, you pompous motherfucker! The last two trolls alive, blood of rust and royalty, will make each other pay for the crimes against their race. Their payment will be mutually dealt in the currency of punishment and reward at once. The Condess will be rewarded with the power and immortality her new service entails, and punished by the grueling slavery for which it is synonymous. And you, young lady, are to be punished by death at the hands of your replacement. And so too will this be your reward. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. My heartbeat falls in rhythm with the clock as I draw close to my prey. I leave nothing to chance, for you see, it is the most dangerous prey of all, a four-foot-tall asshole in suspenders who won't shut up. Wait for it, hussy. Wait for it. And so, my dear, that is the inspiring tale of your people, and why you should feel rather privileged to be in the position for which I have groomed you meticulously. Are you not grateful? 
Yes, surely you are. And it warms the soft, fluffy material in my chest to know this. What is it? What are you looking at over there? Oh, um, of course, the clock. I can see you have a good eye for a fine timepiece. Your exemplary taste is certainly owed to quality upbringing. Perhaps you wish to know the history of the clock and how I came to possess it? Yes, I can see the sparkle of curiosity in your eye. It's a marvelous tale, one almost as long as it is verbosely told. Where do I even begin? <laughs> Trip. Story time's over, windbag! Whoops, oh shit, get this fucking clock out of my way! I am a one-man stampede, and I've got a broom, and that peel of splintering wood you hear is the last gasp of a priceless antique disintegrating beneath the outrageous fury of my authorial hooves. If I have to put up with one more smug, meandering interlude in my own story, I am going to crack your head open and serve you a heaping bowl of your own downy soft puppet ass. How do you like that, Raspitali Doc? I believe you will find that as hosts go, I am simply the best there is! Everybody is totally fed up with your condescending, self-indulgent narrative style. They all want to go back to my slightly less condescending, slightly more self-indulgent style. See? Even that little girl has had enough of your shit. Run, Aradia's ancestor! RUN! You have locked up your last Asian schoolgirl, you sick fuck! Oh, don't you flop around at me like that! Are you listening, little man? Booyah? Hmm... I guess... I guess he's just a limp, lifeless puppet when I'm around. Like a reverse Calvin and Hobbes kind of thing. That is... That is a little disturbing. Girl, quit all this scurrying around! Oh well, might as well try and get that disc back. I wonder if I can just... Just sort of reach up into... And... Do you believe you can escape me before I arrive? How do you expect to outrun me? What the hell? Looks like he's had the disc repaired for a while already, but didn't tell us. Motherfucker just loves the sound of his own voice. When I am already here! Snap! Dowdy! Fuck! No! You don't follow me! Snapping wrong! Unsnap! Unsnap!